Chapter Six of A Child's History of England. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Laura Koskinen. A Child's History of England by Charles Dickens. Chapter Six England under Harold Harefoot, Hardicanute, and Edward the Confessor. Canute left three sons, by name Svein, Harold, and Hardicanute. But his queen, Emma, once the flower of Normandy, was the mother of only Hardicanute. Canute had wished his dominions to be divided between the three, and had wished Harold to have England. But the Saxon people in the south of England, headed by a nobleman with great possessions, called the powerful Earl Godwin, who is said to have been originally a poor cowboy, opposed this, and desired to have instead either Hardicanute or one of the two exiled princes who were over in Normandy. It seemed so certain that there would be more bloodshed to settle this dispute that many people left their homes and took refuge in the woods and swamps. Happily, however, it was agreed to refer the whole question to a great meeting at Oxford which decided that Harold should have all the country north of the Thames, with London for his capital city, and that Hardicanute should have all the south. The quarrel was so arranged, and, as Hardicanute was in Denmark, troubling himself very little about anything but eating and getting drunk, his mother and Earl Godwin governed the south for him. They had hardly begun to do so, and the trembling people who had hidden themselves were scarcely at home again, when Edward, the elder of the two exiled princes, came over from Normandy with a few followers to claim the English crown. His mother Emma, however, who only cared for her last son Hardicanute, instead of assisting him, as he expected, opposed him so strongly with all her influence that he was very soon glad to get safely back. His brother Alfred was not so fortunate. Believing in an affectionate letter, written some time afterwards to him and his brother, in his mother's name, but whether really with or without his mother's knowledge is now uncertain, he allowed himself to be tempted over to England, with a good force of soldiers, and landing on the Kentish coast, and being met and welcomed by Earl Godwin, proceeded into Surrey, as far as the town of Guildford. Here, he and his men halted in the evening to rest, having still the earl in their company, who had ordered lodgings and good cheer for them. But in the dead of the night, when they were off their guard, being divided into small parties, sleeping soundly, after a long march and a plentiful supper in different houses, they were set upon by the king's troops, and taken prisoners. Next morning they were drawn out in a line, to the number of six hundred men, and were barbarously tortured and killed, with the exception of every tenth man who was sold into slavery. As to the wretched Prince Alfred, he was stripped naked, tied to a horse, and sent away into the Isle of Ely, where his eyes were torn out of his head, and where in a few days he miserably died. I am not sure that the Earl had willfully entrapped him, but I suspect it strongly. Harold was now king all over England, though it is doubtful whether the Archbishop of Canterbury, the greater part of the priests were Saxons and not friendly to the Danes, ever consented to crown him. Crowned or uncrowned, with the Archbishop's leave or without it, he was king for four years, after which short reign he died and was buried, having never done much in life but go a-hunting. He was such a fast runner at this, his favorite sport, that the people called him Harold Harefoot. Hardicanute was then at Bruges, in Flanders, plotting with his mother, who had gone over there after the cruel murder of Prince Alfred, for the invasion of England. The Danes and Saxons, finding themselves without a king, and dreading new disputes, made common cause and joined in inviting him to occupy the throne. He consented, and soon troubled them enough, for he brought over numbers of Danes, 
and tax the people so insupportably to enrich those greedy favorites that there were many insurrections, especially one at Worcester, where the citizens rose and killed his tax collectors, in revenge for which he burned their city. He was a brutal king, whose first public act was to order the dead body of poor Harold Harefoot to be dug up, beheaded, and thrown into the river. His end was worthy of such a beginning. He fell down drunk, with a goblet of wine in his hand, at a wedding feast at Lambeth, given in honor of the marriage of his standard bearer, a Dane named Toad the Proud, and he never spoke again. Edward, afterwards called by the monks the Confessor, succeeded, and his first act was to oblige his mother Emma, who had favored him so little, to retire into the country, where she died some ten years afterwards. He was the exiled prince whose brother Alfred had been so foully killed. He had been invited over from Normandy by Hardicanute, in the course of his short reign of two years, and had been handsomely treated at court. His cause was now favored by the powerful Earl Godwin, and he was soon made king. This earl had been suspected by the people, ever since Prince Alfred's cruel death. He had even been tried in the last reign for the prince's murder, but had been pronounced not guilty, chiefly, as it was supposed, because of a present he had made to the swinish king, of a gilded ship with a figurehead of solid gold, and a crew of eighty splendidly armed men. It was his interest to help the new king with his power, if the new king would help him against the popular distrust and hatred. So they made a bargain. Edward the Confessor got the throne. The Earl got more power and more land, and his daughter, Editha, was made queen, for it was a part of their compact that the king should take her for his wife. But although she was a gentle lady, in all things worthy to be beloved, good, beautiful, sensible, and kind, the king from the first neglected her. Her father and her six proud brothers resenting this cold treatment, harassed the king greatly, by exerting all their power to make him unpopular. Having lived so long in Normandy, he preferred the Normans to the English. He made a Norman archbishop, and Norman bishops. His great officers and favorites were all Normans. He introduced the Norman fashions, and the Norman language. In imitation of the state custom of Normandy, he attached a great seal to his state documents, instead of merely marking them, as the Saxon kings had done, with the sign of the cross, just as poor people who have never been taught to write now make the same mark for their names. All this the powerful Earl Godwin and his six proud sons represented to the people as disfavor shown towards the English, and thus they daily increased their own power and daily diminished the power of the king. They were greatly helped by an event that occurred when he had reigned eight years. Eustace, Earl of Boulogne, who had married the king's sister, came to England on a visit. After staying at the court some time, he set forth, with his numerous train of attendants, to return home. They were to embark at Dover. Entering that peaceful town in armor, they took possession of the best houses, and noisily demanded to be lodged and entertained without payment. One of the bold men of Dover, who would not endure to have these domineering strangers jingling their heavy swords and iron corslets up and down his house, eating his meat and drinking his strong liquor, stood in his doorway and refused admission to the first armed man who came there. The armed man drew and wounded him, the man of Dover struck the armed man dead. Intelligence of what he had done, spreading through the streets to where the Count Eustace and his men were standing by their horses, bridle in hand, they passionately mounted, galloped to the house, surrounded it, forced their way in, the doors and windows being closed when they came up, and killed the man of Dover at his own fireside. They then clattered through the streets, cutting down and riding over men, women, and children. This did not last long, you may believe. 
the men of Dover set upon them with great fury, killed nineteen of the foreigners, wounded many more, and blockading the road to the port so that they should not embark, beat them out of the town by the way they had come. Hereupon Count Eustace rides as hard as man can ride to Gloucester, where Edward is, surrounded by Norman monks and Norman lords. Justice, cries the Count, upon the men of Dover, who have set upon and slain my people. The king sends immediately for the powerful Earl Godwin, who happens to be near, reminds him that Dover is under his government, and orders him to repair to Dover and do military execution on the inhabitants. It does not become you, says the proud earl in reply, to condemn without a hearing those whom you have sworn to protect. I will not do it. The king, therefore, summoned the earl on pain of banishment and loss of his titles and property, to appear before the court to answer this disobedience. The earl refused to appear. He, his eldest son Harold, and his second son Svein, hastily raised as many fighting men as their utmost power could collect, and demanded to have Count Eustace and his followers surrendered to the justice of the country. The king, in his turn, refused to give them up, and raised a strong force. After some treaty and delay, the troops of the great earl and his sons began to fall off. The earl, with a part of his family and abundance of treasure, sailed to Flanders. Harold escaped to Ireland, and the power of the great family was for that time gone in England. But the people did not forget them. Then Edward the Confessor, with the true meanness of a mean spirit, visited his dislike of the once powerful father and sons upon the helpless daughter and sister, his unoffending wife, whom all who saw her, her husband and his monks excepted, loved. He seized rapaciously upon her fortune and her jewels, and allowing her only one attendant, confined her in a gloomy convent, of which a sister of his, no doubt an unpleasant lady after his own heart, was abbess or jailer. Having got Earl Godwin and his six sons well out of his way, the king favoured the Normans more than ever. He invited over William, Duke of Normandy, the son of that duke who had received him and his murdered brother long ago, and of a peasant girl, a tanner's daughter, with whom that duke had fallen in love for her beauty as he saw her washing clothes in a brook. William, who was a great warrior, with a passion for fine horses, dogs, and arms, accepted the invitation, and the Normans in England, finding themselves more numerous than ever when he arrived with his retinue, and held in still greater honour at court than before, became more and more haughty towards the people, and were more and more disliked by them. The old Earl Godwin, though he was abroad, knew well how the people felt, for, with part of the treasure he had carried away with him, he kept spies and agents in his pay all over England. Accordingly, he thought the time was come for fitting out a great expedition against the Norman-loving king. With it he sailed to the Isle of Wight, where he was joined by his son Harold, the most gallant and brave of all his family. And so the father and son came sailing up the Thames to Southwark, great numbers of the people declaring for them, and shouting for the English Earl and the English Herald, against the Norman favourites. The king was at first as blind and stubborn as kings usually have been, whensoever they have been in the hands of monks. But the people rallied so thickly round the old Earl and his son, and the old earl was so steady in demanding, without bloodshed, the restoration of himself and his family to their rights, that at last the court took the alarm. The Norman Archbishop of Canterbury, and the Norman Bishop of London, surrounded by their retainers, fought their way out of London, and escaped from Essex to France in a fishing boat. The other Norman favourites dispersed in all directions. The old earl and his sons, except Svein, who had committed crimes against the law, were restored to their possessions and dignities. 
Aditha, the virtuous and lovely queen of the insensible king, was triumphantly released from her prison, the convent, and once more sat in her chair of state, arrayed in the jewels of which, when she had no champion to support her rights, her cold-blooded husband had deprived her. The old Earl Godwin did not long enjoy his restored fortune. He fell down in a fit at the king's table, and died upon the third day afterwards. Harold succeeded to his power, and to a far higher place in the attachment of the people than his father had ever held. By his valor he subdued the king's enemies in many bloody fights. He was vigorous against rebels in Scotland. This was the time when Macbeth slew Duncan, upon which event our English Shakespeare, hundreds of years afterwards, wrote his great tragedy, and he killed the restless Welsh king Griffith, and brought his head to England. What Harold was doing at sea, when he was driven on the French coast by a tempest, is not at all certain, nor does it at all matter. That his ship was forced by a storm on that shore, and that he was taken prisoner, there is no doubt. In those barbarous days all shipwrecked strangers were taken prisoners, and obliged to pay ransom. So a certain Count Guy, who was the lord of Ponthieu, where Harold's disaster happened, seized him, instead of relieving him like a hospitable and Christian lord as he ought to have done, and expected to make a very good thing of it. But Harold sent off immediately to Duke William of Normandy, complaining of this treatment, and the duke no sooner heard of it than he ordered Harold to be escorted to the ancient town of Rouen, where he then was, and where he received him as an honoured guest. Now, some writers tell us that Edward the Confessor, who was by this time old and had no children, had made a will, appointing Duke William of Normandy his successor, and had informed the duke of his having done so, there is no doubt that he was anxious about his successor, because he had even invited over from abroad Edward the outlaw, a son of Ironside, who had come to England with his wife and three children, but whom the king had strangely refused to see when he did come, and who had died in London suddenly. Princes were terribly liable to sudden death in those days, and had been buried in St. Paul's Cathedral the king might possibly have made such a will, or, having always been fond of the Normans, he might have encouraged Norman William to aspire to the English crown, by something that he said to him when he was staying at the English court. But certainly William did now aspire to it, and knowing that Harold would be a powerful rival, he called together a great assembly of his nobles, offered Harold his daughter Adele in marriage, informed him that he meant on King Edward's death to claim the English crown as his own inheritance, and required Harold then and there to swear to aid him. Harold, being in the duke's power, took this oath upon the missal, or prayer-book. It is a good example of the superstitions of the monks that this missal, instead of being placed upon a table, was placed upon a tub, which, when Harold had sworn, was uncovered and shown to be full of dead men's bones, bones, as the monks pretended, of saints. This was supposed to make Harold's oath a great deal more impressive and binding, as if the great name of the Creator of heaven and earth could be made more solemn by a knuckle-bone, or a double-tooth, or a fingernail of Dunstan. Within a week or two, after Harold's return to England, the dreary old confessor was found to be dying. After wandering in his mind like a very weak old man, he died. As he had put himself entirely in the hands of the monks when he was alive, they praised him lustily when he was dead. They had gone so far already, as to persuade him that he could work miracles, and had brought people afflicted with a bad disorder of the skin to him to be touched and cured. This was called Touching for the King's Evil, which afterwards became a royal custom. You know, however, who really touched the sick, and healed them, 
and you know his sacred name is not among the dusty line of human kings. End of chapter 6 Recording by Laura Koskinen Chapter 7 of A Child's History of England. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Laura Koskinen. A Child's History of England by Charles Dickens. Chapter 7 England under Harold the Second and Conquered by the Normans. Harold was crowned King of England on the very day of the maudlin confessor's funeral. He had good need to be quick about it. When the news reached Norman William, hunting in his park at Rouen, he dropped his bow, returned to his palace, called his nobles to council, and presently sent ambassadors to Harold, calling on him to keep his oath and resign the crown. Harold would do no such thing. The barons of France leagued together round Duke William for the invasion of England. Duke William promised freely to distribute English wealth and English lands among them. The Pope sent to Normandy a consecrated banner, and a ring containing a hair, which he warranted to have grown on the head of St. Peter. He blessed the enterprise, and cursed Harold, and requested that the Normans would pay Peter's pence or a tax to himself of a penny a year on every house, a little more regularly in future, if they could make it convenient. King Harold had a rebel brother in Flanders, who was a vassal of Harold Hardrada, king of Norway. This brother and this Norwegian king, joining their forces against England with Duke William's help, won a fight in which the English were commanded by two nobles, and then besieged York. Harold, who was waiting for the Normans on the coast at Hastings, with his army, marched to Stamford Bridge upon the river Derwent to give them instant battle. He found them drawn up in a hollow circle, marked out by their shining spears. Riding round this circle at a distance to survey it, he saw a brave figure on horseback, in a blue mantle and a bright helmet, whose horse suddenly stumbled and threw him. "'Who is that man who has fallen?' Harold asked of one of his captains. "'The king of Norway,' he replied. "'He is a tall and stately king,' said Harold. "'But his end is near.' He added, in a little while, "'Go yonder to my brother and tell him, "'if he withdraw his troops, "'he shall be Earl of Northumberland "'and rich and powerful in England.' The captain rode away and gave the message." "'What will he give to my friend, the King of Norway?' asked the brother. Seven feet of earth for a grave,' replied the captain. "'No more,' returned the brother with a smile. "'The King of Norway, being a tall man, perhaps a little more,' replied the captain. "'Ride back,' said the brother, "'and tell King Harold to make ready for the fight.' He did so very soon." and such a fight King Harold led against that force, that his brother, and the Norwegian king, and every chief of note in all their host, except the Norwegian king's son Olaf, to whom he gave honorable dismissal, were left dead upon the field. The victorious army marched to York. As King Harold sat there, at the feast, in the midst of all his company, a stir was heard at the doors, and messengers, all covered with mire, from riding far and fast through broken ground, came hurrying in, to report that the Normans had landed in England. The intelligence was true. They had been tossed about by contrary winds, and some of their ships had been wrecked. A part of their own shore, to which they had been driven back, was strewn with Norman bodies. But they had once more made sail, led by the duke's own galley, a present from his wife, upon the prow whereof the figure of a golden boy stood pointing towards England. By day, the banner of the three lions of Normandy, 
the diverse colored sails, the gilded vans, the many decorations of this gorgeous ship, had glittered in the sun and sunny water. By night a light had sparkled like a star at her masthead, and now, encamped near Hastings, with their leader lying in the old Roman castle of Pevensey, the English retiring in all directions, the land for miles around scorched and smoking, fired and pillaged, was the whole Norman power, hopeful and strong on English ground. Harold broke up the feast and hurried to London. Within a week his army was ready. He sent out spies to ascertain the Norman strength. William took them, caused them to be led through his whole camp, and then dismissed. The Normans, said these spies to Harold, are not bearded on the upper lip as we English are, but are shorn. They are priests. My men, replied Harold with a laugh, will find those priests good soldiers. The Saxons reported Duke William's outposts of Norman soldiers, who were instructed to retire as King Harold's army advanced, rush on us through their pillaged country with the fury of madmen. Let them come, and come soon, said Duke William. Some proposals for a reconciliation were made, but were soon abandoned. In the middle of the month of October, in the year 1066, the Normans and the English came front to front. All night the armies lay encamped before each other, in a part of the country then called Senlac, now called, in remembrance of them, Battle. With the first dawn of the day they arose. There in the faint light were the English on a hill, a wood behind them, in their midst the royal banner, representing a fighting warrior woven in gold thread, adorned with precious stones. Beneath the banner, as it rustled in the wind, stood King Harold on foot, with two of his remaining brothers by his side. Around them, still and silent as the dead, clustered the whole English army. Every soldier covered by his shield, and bearing in his hand his dreaded English battle-axe. On an opposite hill, in three lines, archers, foot-soldiers, horsemen, was the Norman force. Of a sudden a great battle-cry, God help us, burst from the Norman lines. The English answered with their own battle-cry, God's rude, holy rude. The Normans then came sweeping down the hill to attack the English. There was one tall Norman knight who rode before the Norman army on a prancing horse, throwing up his heavy sword and catching it, and singing of the bravery of his countrymen. An English knight, who rode out from the English force to meet him, fell by this knight's hand. Another English knight rode out, and he fell too. But then a third rode out, and killed the Norman. This was in the first beginning of the fight. It soon raged everywhere. The English, keeping side by side in a great mass, cared no more for the showers of Norman arrows than if they had been showers of Norman rain. When the Norman horsemen rode against them, with their battle-axes they cut men and horses down. The Normans gave way. The English pressed forward. A cry went forth among the Norman troops that Duke William was killed. Duke William took off his helmet, in order that his face might be distinctly seen, and rode along the line before his men. This gave them courage. As they turned again to face the English, some of their Norman horse divided the pursuing body of the English from the rest, and thus all that foremost portion of the English army fell, fighting bravely. The main body still remaining firm, heedless of the Norman arrows, and with their battle-axes cutting down the crowds of horsemen when they rode up, like forests of young trees, Duke William pretended to retreat. The eager English followed. The Norman army closed again, and fell upon them with great slaughter. Still, said Duke William, there are thousands of the English, firm as rocks around their king, 
Shoot upward, Norman archers, that your arrows may fall down upon their faces. The sun rose high, and sank, and the battle still raged. Through all the wild October day, the clash and din resounded in the air. In the red sunset, and in the white moonlight, heaps upon heaps of dead men lay strewn, a dreadful spectacle, all over the ground. King Harold, wounded with an arrow in the eye, was nearly blind. His brothers were already killed. Twenty Norman knights, whose battered armor had flashed fiery and golden in the sunshine all day long, and now looked silvery in the moonlight, dashed forward to seize the royal banner from the English knights and soldiers, still faithfully collected round their blinded king. The king received a mortal wound and dropped. The English broke and fled. The Normans rallied, and the day was lost. Oh, what a sight beneath the moon and stars! When lights were shining in the tent of the victorious Duke William, which was pitched near the spot where Harold fell, and he and his knights were carousing within, and soldiers with torches, going slowly to and fro without, sought for the corpse of Harold among piles of dead, and the warrior, worked in golden thread and precious stones, lay low, all torn and soiled with blood, and the three Norman lions kept watch over the field. End of chapter 7 Recording by Laura Koskinen Chapter 8 of A Child's History of England This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sarah Jennings. A Child's History of England by Charles Dickens. Chapter 8. England under William I, the Norman Conqueror. Upon the ground where brave Harold fell, William the Norman afterwards founded an abbey, which, under the name of Battle Abbey, was a rich and splendid place through many a troubled year, though now it is a grey ruin overgrown with ivy. But the first work he had to do was to conquer the English thoroughly, and that, as you know by this time, was hard work for any man. He ravaged several counties, he burned and plundered many towns, he laid waste scores upon scores of miles of pleasant country, he destroyed innumerable lives. At length Stigand, Archbishop of Canterbury, with other representatives of the clergy and people, went to his camp and submitted to him. Edgar, the insignificant son of Edmund Ironside, was proclaimed king by others, but nothing came of it. He fled to Scotland afterwards, where his sister, who was young and beautiful, married the Scottish king. Edgar himself was not important enough for anybody to care much about him. On Christmas Day, William was crowned in Westminster Abbey, under the title of William I but he is best known as William the Conqueror. It was a strange coronation. One of the bishops who performed the ceremony asked the Normans in French if they would have Duke William for their king. They answered yes. Another of the bishops put the same question to the Saxons in English. They too answered yes with a loud shout. The noise being heard by a guard of Norman horse soldiers outside was mistaken for resistance on the part of the English. The guard instantly set fire to the neighbouring houses, and a tumult ensued, in the midst of which the king, being left alone in the abbey, with a few priests, and they all being in a terrible fright together, was hurriedly crowned. When the crown was placed upon his head, he swore to govern the English, as well as the best of their own monarchs. I dare say you think, as I do, that if we accept the great Alfred, he might pretty easily have done that. Numbers of the English nobles had been killed in the last disastrous battle. Their estates, and the estates of all the nobles who had fought against him there, King William seized upon, and gave to his own Norman knights and nobles. Many great English families of the present time acquired their English lands in this way, and are very proud of it. But what is got by force must be maintained by force. These nobles were obliged to build castles all over England to defend their new property, and do what he would the king could neither soothe nor quell the nation as he wished. He gradually introduced the Norman language and the Norman customs. 
yet for a long time the great body of the English remained sullen and revengeful. On his going over to Normandy to visit his subjects there, the oppressions of his half-brother Odo, whom he left in charge of his English kingdom, drove the people mad. The men of Kent even invited over to take possession of Dover their old enemy Count Eustace of Boulogne, who had led the fray when the Dover man was slain at his own fireside. The men of Hereford, aided by the Welsh, and commanded by a chief named Edric the Wild, drove the Normans out of their country. Some of those who had been dispossessed of their lands banded together in the north of England, some in Scotland, some in the thick woods and marshes, and whensoever they could fall upon the Normans, or upon the English who had submitted to the Normans, they fought, despoiled, and murdered, like the desperate outlaws that they were. Conspiracies were set on foot for a general massacre of the Normans, like the old massacre of the Danes. In short, the English were in a murderous mood all through the kingdom. King William, fearing he might lose his conquest, came back, and tried to pacify the London people by soft words. He then set forth to repress the country people by stern deeds, among the towns which he besieged, and where he killed and maimed the inhabitants without any distinction, sparing none, young or old, armed or unarmed, were Oxford, Warwick, Leicester, Nottingham, Derby, Lincoln, York. In all these places, and in many others, fire and sword worked their utmost horrors, and made the land dreadful to behold. The streams and rivers were discoloured with blood, the sky was blackened with smoke, the fields were wastes of ashes, the waysides were heaped up with dead. Such are the fatal results of conquest and ambition. Although William was a harsh and angry man, I do not suppose that he deliberately meant to work this shocking ruin when he invaded England. But what he had got by the strong hand, he could only keep by the strong hand, and in so doing he made England a great grave. Two sons of Harold, by the name Edmund and Godwin, came over from Ireland, with some ships against the Normans, but were defeated. This was scarcely done when the outlaws in the woods so harassed York that the governor sent to the king for help. The king dispatched a general and a large force to occupy the town of Durham. The bishop of that place met the general outside the town and warned him not to enter, as he would be in danger there. The general cared nothing for the warning and went in with all his men. That night on every hill within sight of Durham signal fires were seen to blaze. When the morning dawned, the English, who had assembled in great strength, forced the gates, rushed into the town, and slew the Normans every one. The English afterwards besought the Danes to come and help them. The Danes came with two hundred and forty ships. The outlawed nobles joined them. They captured York, and drove the Normans out of that city. Then William bribed the Danes to go away, and took such vengeance on the English that all the former fire and sword, smoke and ashes, death and ruin, were nothing compared with it. In melancholy songs and doleful stories, it was still sung and told by cottage fires on winter evenings, a hundred years afterwards, how, in those dreadful days of the Normans, there was not, from the River Humber to the River Tyne, one inhabited village left, nor one cultivated field, how there was nothing but a dismal ruin, where the human creatures and the beasts lay dead together. The outlaws had at this time what they called a camp of refuge, in the midst of the fens of Cambridgeshire. Protected by those marshy grounds which were difficult of approach, they lay among the reeds and rushes, and were hidden by the mists that rose up from the watery earth. Now there was also at that time over the sea in Flanders an Englishman named Hereward, whose father had died in his absence, and whose property had been given to a Norman. When he heard of this wrong that had been done him, from such of the exiled English as chanced to wander into that country, he longed for revenge, and joining the outlaws in their camp of refuge became their commander. He was so good a soldier that the Normans supposed him to be aided by enchantment. William, even after he had made a road three miles in length across the Cambridgeshire marshes on purpose to attack this supposed enchanter, thought it necessary to engage an old lady who pretended to be a sorceress, to come and do a little enchantment in the royal cause. For this purpose she was pushed on before the troops in a wooden tower, but Hereward very soon disposed of this unfortunate sorceress by burning her tower and all. The monks of the convent of Eli near at hand, however, who were fond of good living, 
and who found it very uncomfortable to have the country blockaded and their supplies of meat and drink cut off, showed the king a secret way of surprising the camp. So Hereward was soon defeated. Whether he afterwards died quietly, or whether he was killed after killing sixteen of the men who attacked him, as some old rhymes relate that he did, I cannot say. His defeat put an end to the camp of refuge, and very soon afterwards the king, victorious both in Scotland and in England, quelled the last rebellious English noble. He then surrounded himself with Norman lords, enriched by the property of the English nobles, had a great survey made of all the land in England, which was entered as the property of its new owners, on a roll called the Doomsday Book, obliged the people to put out their fires and candles at a certain hour every night, on the ringing of a bell which was called the curfew, introduced the Norman dresses and manners, made the Normans masters everywhere, and the English servants, turned out the English bishops, and put Normans in their places, and showed himself to be the conqueror indeed. But even with his own Normans he had a restless life. They were always hungering and thirsting for the riches of the English, and the more he gave, the more they wanted. His priests were as greedy as his soldiers. We know of only one Norman who plainly told his master, the king, that he had come with him to England to do his duty as a faithful servant, and that property taken by force from other men had no charms for him. His name was Guibert. We should not forget his name, for it is good to remember and to honour honest men. Besides all these troubles, William the Conqueror was troubled by quarrels among his sons. He had three living. Robert, called Curthose because of his short legs. William, called Rufus, or the Red, from the colour of his hair. And Henry, fond of learning, and called in the Norman language Beauclerc, or Fine Scholar. When Robert grew up, he asked of his father the government of Normandy, which he had nominally possessed as a child under his mother Matilda. The king refusing to grant it, Robert became jealous and discontented, and happening one day well in this temper to be ridiculed by his brothers, who threw water on him from a balcony as he was walking before the door, he drew his sword, rushed upstairs, and was only prevented by the king himself from putting them to death. That same night he hotly departed with some followers from his father's court, and endeavoured to take the castle of Rouen by surprise. Failing in this, he shut himself up in another castle in Normandy, which the king besieged, and where Robert one day unhorsed and nearly killed him without knowing who he was. His submission when he discovered his father, and the intercession of the queen and others, reconciled them, but not soundly, for Robert soon strayed abroad and went from court to court with his complaints. He was a gay, careless, thoughtless fellow, spending all he got on musicians and dancers. But his mother loved him, and often, against the king's command, supplied him with money through a messenger named Samson. At length the incensed king swore he would tear out Samson's eyes, and Samson, thinking that his only hope of safety was in becoming a monk, became one, and went on such errands no more, and kept his eyes in his head. All this time, from the turbulent day of his strange coronation, the conqueror had been struggling, you see, at any cost of cruelty and bloodshed, to maintain what he had seized. All his reign he struggled still, with the same object ever before him. He was a stern, bold man, and he succeeded in it. He loved money, and was particular in his eating, but he had only leisure to indulge one other passion, and that was his love of hunting. He carried it to such a height that he ordered whole villages and towns to be swept away to make forests for the deer. Not satisfied with sixty-eight royal forests, he laid waste to an immense district to form another in Hampshire called the New Forest. The many thousands of miserable peasants who saw their little houses pulled down, and themselves and children turned into the open country without a shelter, detested him for his merciless addition to their many sufferings. And when, in the twenty-first year of his reign, which proved to be the last, he went over to Rouen, England was as full of hatred against him as if every leaf on every tree in all his royal forests had been a curse upon his head. In the new forest his son Richard, for he had four sons, had been gored to death by a stag, and the people said that this cruelly made forest would yet be fatal to others of the conqueror's race. He was engaged in a dispute with the king of France about some territory. While he stayed at Rouen, negotiating with that king, he kept his bed and took medicines, being advised by his physicians to do so, on account of having grown to an unwieldy size. Word being brought to him that the king of France made light of this, and joked about it, he swore in a great rage that he should rue his jests. He assembled his army, 
marched into the disputed territory, burnt his old way, the vines, the crops, and fruit, and set the town of Mantes on fire. But in an evil hour, for as he rode over the hot ruins, his horse, setting his hoofs upon some burning embers, started, threw him forward against the pommel of the saddle, and gave him a mortal hurt. For six weeks he lay dying in a monastery near Rouen, and then made his will giving England to William, Normandy to Robert, and five thousand pounds to Henry. And now his violent deeds lay heavy on his mind. He ordered money to be given to many English churches and monasteries, and, which was much better repentance, released his prisoners of state, some of whom had been confined in his dungeons twenty years. It was a September morning, and the sun was rising, when the king was awakened from slumber by the sound of a church bell. "'What bell is that?' he faintly asked. They told him it was the bell of the chapel of St. Mary. "'I commend my soul,' said he, "'to Mary,' and died. Think of his name, the Conqueror, and then consider how he lay in death. The moment he was dead, his physicians, priests, and nobles, not knowing what contest for the throne might now take place, or what might happen in it, hastened away, each man for himself and his own property. The mercenary servants of the court began to rob and plunder. The body of the king, in the indecent strife, was rolled from the bed, and lay alone for hours upon the ground. O conqueror, of whom so many great names are proud now, of whom so many great names thought nothing then, it were better to have conquered one true heart than England. By and by the priests came creeping in with prayers and candles, and a good knight named Herr Luen undertook, which no one else would do, to convey the body to Cain, in Normandy, in order that it might be buried in St. Stephen's Church there, which the conqueror had founded. But fire, of which he had made such bad use in his life, seemed to follow him of itself in death. A great conflagration broke out in the town when the body was placed in the church, and those present running out to extinguish the flames, it was once again left alone. It was not even buried in peace. It was about to be let down in its royal robes into a tomb near the high altar, in presence of a great concourse of people, when a loud voice in the crowd cried out, This ground is mine. Upon it stood my father's house. This king despoiled me of both ground and house to build this church. In the great name of God, I here forbid his body to be covered with the earth that is my right. The priests and bishops present, knowing the speaker's right, and knowing that the king had often denied him justice, paid him down sixty shillings for the grave. Even then the corpse was not at rest. The tomb was too small, and they tried to force it in. It broke. A dreadful smell arose, and the people hurried out into the air, and for the third time it was left alone. Where were the conqueror's three sons that they were not at their father's burial? Robert was lounging among minstrels, dancers, and gamesters in France or Germany. Henry was carrying his five thousand pounds safely away in a convenient chest he had got made. William the Red was hurrying to England to lay hands upon the royal treasure and the crown. End of chapter 8、Nine、of A Child's History of England. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sarah Jennings. A Child's History of England by Charles Dickens. Chapter 9 England under William II, called Rufus. William the Red, in breathless haste, secured the three great forts of Dover, Pevensey, and Hastings, and made with hot speed for Winchester, where the royal treasure was kept. The treasurer delivering him the keys, he found that it amounted to sixty thousand pounds in silver, besides gold and jewels. Possessed of this wealth, he soon persuaded the Archbishop of Canterbury to crown him, and became William the Second, King of England. Rufus was no sooner on the throne than he ordered into prison again the unhappy state captives whom his father had set free, and directed a goldsmith to ornament his father's tomb profusely with gold and silver. It would have been more dutiful in him to have attended the sick conqueror when he was dying. But England itself, like this red king who once governed it, has sometimes made expensive tombs for dead men whom it treated shabbily when they were alive. 
the king's brother, Robert of Normandy, seemed quite content to be only duke of that country, and the king's other brother, fine scholar, being quiet enough with his five thousand pounds in a chest, the king flattered himself, we may suppose, with the hope of an easy reign. But easy reigns were difficult to have in those days. The turbulent Bishop Odo, who had blessed the Norman army at the Battle of Hastings, and who I dare say took all the credit of the victory to himself, soon began, in concert with some powerful Norman nobles, to trouble the Red King. The truth seems to be that this bishop and his friends, who had land in England and lands in Normandy, wished to hold both under one sovereign, and greatly preferred a thoughtless, good-natured person such as Robert was, to Rufus, who, though being far from an amiable man in any respect, was keen and not to be imposed upon. They declared in Robert's favour and retired to their castles, those castles were very troublesome to kings, in a sullen humour. The Red King, seeing the Normans thus falling from him, revenged himself upon them by appealing to the English, to whom he made a variety of promises which he never meant to perform, in particular promises to soften the cruelty of the forest laws, and who in return so aided him with their valour that Odo was besieged in the castle of Rochester and forced to abandon it, and to depart from England for ever, whereupon the other rebellious Norman nobles were soon reduced and scattered. Then the Red King went over to Normandy, where the people suffered greatly under the loose rule of Duke Robert. The King's object was to seize upon the Duke's dominions. This the Duke, of course, prepared to resist, and miserable war between the two brothers seemed inevitable, when the powerful nobles on both sides, who had seen so much of war, interfered to prevent it. A treaty was made. Each of the two brothers agreed to give up something of his claims, and that the longer liver of the two should inherit all the dominions of the other. When they had come to this loving understanding, they embraced and joined their forces against Fine Scholar, who had bought some territory of Robert with a part of his five thousand pounds, and was considered a dangerous individual in consequence. St. Michael's Mount in Normandy, there is another St. Michael's Mount in Cornwall, wonderfully like it, was then, as it is now, a strong place perched upon the top of a high rock, around which, when the tide is in, the sea flows, leaving no road to the mainland. In this place, Fine Scholar shut himself up with his soldiers, and here he was closely besieged by his two brothers. At one time, when he was reduced to great distress for want of water, the generous Robert not only permitted his men to get water, but sent Fine Scholar wine from his own table and, on being remonstrated with by the Red King, said, What? Shall we let our own brother die of thirst? Where shall we get another when he is gone? At another time, the Red King, riding alone on the shore of the bay, looking up at the castle, was taken by two of Fine Scholar's men, one of whom was about to kill him, when he cried out, Hold, knave! I am the King of England! The story says that the soldier raised him from the ground respectfully and humbly, and that the King took him into his service. The story may or may not be true, but at any rate it is true that Fine Scholar could not hold out against his united brothers, and that he abandoned Mount St. Michael, and wandered about, as poor and forlorn as other scholars have been sometimes known to be. The Scotch became unquiet in the Red King's time, and were twice defeated, the second time with the loss of their king Malcolm and his son. The Welsh became unquiet too. Against them Rufus was less successful, for they fought among their native mountains and did great execution on the king's troops. Robert of Normandy became unquiet too, and complaining that his brother the king did not faithfully perform his part of their agreement, took up arms, and obtained assistance from the king of France, whom Rufus, in the end, bought off with vast sums of money. England became unquiet too. Lord Mowbray, the powerful Earl of Northumberland, headed a great conspiracy to depose the king, and to place upon the throne Stephen, the conqueror's near relative. The plot was discovered all the chief conspirators were seized, some were fined, some were put in prison, and some were put to death. The Earl of Northumberland himself was shut up in a dungeon beneath Windsor Castle, where he died an old man, thirty long years afterwards. The priests in England were more unquiet than any other class or power, for the Red King treated them with such small ceremony that he refused to appoint new bishops or archbishops when the old ones died, but kept all the wealth belonging to those offices in his own hands. In return for this, the priests wrote his life when he was dead, and abused him well. I am inclined to think, myself, that there was little to choose between the priests and the Red King. 
that both sides were greedy and designing, and that they were fairly matched. The Red King was false of heart, selfish, covetous, and mean. He had a worthy minister in his favorite, Ralph, nicknamed, for almost every famous person had a nickname in those rough days, Flambard, or the Firebrand. Once, the king being ill, became penitent, and made Anselm, a foreign priest and a good man, Archbishop of Canterbury. But he no sooner got well again than he repented of his repentance, and persisted in wrongfully keeping to himself some of the wealth belonging to the archbishopric. This led to violent disputes, which were aggravated by there being in Rome at that time two rival popes, each of whom declared he was the only real, original, infallible pope, who couldn't make a mistake. At last, Anselm, knowing the Red King's character, and not feeling himself safe in England, asked leave to return abroad. The Red King gladly gave it, for he knew that as soon as Anselm was gone, he could begin to store up all the Canterbury money again, for his own use. By such means, and by taxing and oppressing the English people in every possible way, the Red King became very rich. When he wanted money for any purpose, he raised it by some means or other, and cared nothing for the injustice he did, or the misery he caused. Having the opportunity of buying from Robert the whole Duchy of Normandy for five years, he taxed the English people more than ever, and made the very convents sell their plate and valuables to supply him with the means to make the purchase. But he was as quick and eager in putting down revolt as he was in raising money, for a part of the Norman people objecting, very naturally, I think, to being sold in this way, he headed an army against them with all the speed and energy of his father. He was so impatient that he embarked for Normandy in a great gale of wind, and when the sailors told him it was dangerous to go to sea in such angry weather, he replied, Hoist and sail away! Did you ever hear of a king who was drowned? You will wonder how it was that even the careless Robert came to sell his dominions. It happened thus. It had long been the custom for many English people to make journeys to Jerusalem, which were called pilgrimages, in order that they might pray beside the tomb of our Saviour there. Jerusalem belonging to the Turks, and the Turks hating Christianity, these Christian travellers were often insulted and ill-used. The pilgrims bore it patiently for some time, but at length a remarkable man of great earnestness and eloquence, called Peter the Hermit, began to preach in various places against the Turks, and to declare that it was the duty of good Christians to drive away those unbelievers from the tomb of our Saviour, and to take possession of it and protect it. An excitement such as the world had never known before was created. Thousands and thousands of men of all ranks and conditions departed for Jerusalem to make war against the Turks. This war is called in history the First Crusade, and every crusader wore a cross marked on his right shoulder. All the crusaders were not zealous Christians. Among them were vast numbers of the restless, idle, profligate, and adventurous spirit of the time. Some became crusaders for the love of change, some in hope of plunder, some because they had nothing to do at home, some because they did what the priests told them, some because they liked to see foreign countries, some because they were fond of knocking men about, and would as soon knock a Turk about as a Christian. Robert of Normandy may have been influenced by all these motives, and by a kind desire, besides, to save the Christian pilgrims from bad treatment in the future. He wanted to raise a number of armed men, and to go to the crusade. He could not do so without money. He had no money, and he sold his dominions to his brother, the Red King, for five years. With the large sum he thus obtained, he fitted out his crusaders gallantly, and went away to Jerusalem in martial state. The Red King, who made money out of everything, stayed at home, busily squeezing more money out of Normans and English. After three years of great hardship and suffering, from shipwreck at sea, from travel in strange lands, from hunger, thirst, and fever upon the burning sands of the desert, and from the fury of the Turks, the valiant crusaders got possession of our Saviour's tomb. The Turks were still resisting and fighting bravely, but this success increased the general desire in Europe to join the crusade. Another great French duke was proposing to sell his dominions for a term to the rich Red King, when the Red King's reign came to a sudden and violent end. You have not forgotten the new forest which the conqueror made, and which the miserable people whose homes he laid waste so hated. The cruelty of the forest laws, and the torture and death they brought upon the peasantry, increased this hatred, 
the poor persecuted country people believed that the new forest was enchanted. They said that in thunderstorms and on dark nights demons appeared, moving beneath the branches of the gloomy trees. They said that a terrible specter had foretold to Norman hunters that the Red King should be punished there. And now, in the pleasant season of May, when the Red King had reigned almost thirteen years, and a second prince of the conqueror's blood, another Richard, the son of Duke Robert, was killed by an arrow in this dreaded forest, the people said that the second time was not the last, and that there was another death to come. It was a lonely forest, accursed in the people's hearts for the wicked deeds that had been done to make it, and no man save the king and his courtiers and huntsmen liked to stray there. But in reality it was like any other forest. In the spring the green leaves broke out of the buds. In the summer flourished heartily and made deep shades. In the winter shriveled and blew down and lay in brown heaps on the moss. Some trees were stately and grew high and strong. Some had fallen of themselves. Some were felled by the forester's axe. Some were hollow and the rabbits burrowed at their roots. Some few were struck by lightning and stood white and bare. There were hillsides covered with rich fern, on which the morning dew so beautifully sparkled. There were brooks where the deer went down to drink, or over which the whole herd bounded, flying from the arrows of the huntsmen. There were sunny glades and solemn places where but little light came through the rustling leaves. The songs of the birds in the new forest were pleasanter to hear than the shouts of fighting men outside, and even when the Red King and his court came hunting through its solitudes, cursing loud and riding hard with a jingling of stirrups and bridles and knives and daggers, they did much less harm there than among the English or Normans, and the stags died, as they lived, far easier than the people. Upon a day in August, the Red King, now reconciled to his brother, Fine Scholar, came with a great train to hunt in the new forest. Fine Scholar was of the party. They were a merry party, and had lain all night at Melwood Keep, a hunting lodge in the forest, where they had made good cheer both at supper and breakfast, and had drunk a deal of wine. The party dispersed in various directions, as the custom of the hunters then was. The king took with him only Sir Walter Tyrrell, who was a famous sportsman, and to whom he had given, before they mounted horse that morning, two fine arrows. The last time the king was ever seen alive, he was riding with Sir Walter Tyrrell, and their dogs were hunting together. It was almost night when a poor charcoal burner, passing through the forest with his cart, came upon the solitary body of a dead man, shot with an arrow in the breast, and still bleeding. He got it into his cart. It was the body of the king. Shaken and tumbled, with its red beard all whitened with lime and clotted with blood, it was driven in the cart by the charcoal burner next day to Winchester Cathedral, where it was received and buried. Sir Walter Tyrrell, who escaped to Normandy, and claimed the protection of the King of France, swore in France that the Red King was suddenly shot dead by an arrow from an unseen hand while they were hunting together, that he was fearful of being suspected as the King's murderer, and that he instantly set spurs to horse and fled to the seashore. Others declared that the King and Sir Walter Tyrrell were hunting in company, a little before sunset, standing in bushes opposite one another when a stag came between them, that the King drew his bow and took aim, but the string broke, that the king then cried, Shoot, Walter, in the devil's name, that Sir Walter shot, that the arrow glanced against a tree, was turned aside from the stag, and struck the king from his horse, dead. By whose hand the red king really fell, and whether that hand dispatched the arrow to his breast by accident or by design, is only known to God. Some think his brother may have caused him to be killed, but the red king had made so many enemies, both among priests and people, that suspicion may reasonably rest upon a less unnatural murderer. Men know no more than that he was found dead in the new forest, which the suffering people had regarded as a doomed ground for his race. End of chapter 9《of A Child's History of England》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sarah Jennings. A Child's History of England by Charles Dickens. Chapter 10. England under Henry I. Called Fine Scholar. Fine Scholar, on hearing of the Red King's death, 
hurried to Winchester with as much speed as Rufus himself had made, to seize the royal treasure. But the keeper of the treasure, who had been one of the hunting party in the forest, made haste to Winchester too, and arriving there at about the same time, refused to yield it up. Upon this, Fine Scholar drew his sword, and threatened to kill the treasurer, who might have paid for his fidelity with his life, but that he knew longer resistance to be useless when he found the prince supported by a company of powerful barons, who declared they were determined to make him king. The treasurer, therefore, gave up the money and jewels of the crown, and on the third day after the death of the Red King, being a Sunday, Fine Scholar stood before the high altar in Westminster Abbey, and made a solemn declaration that he would resign the church property which his brother had seized, that he would do no wrong to the nobles, and that he would restore to the people the laws of Edward the Confessor, with all the improvements of William the Conqueror. So began the reign of King Henry I. The people were attached to their new king, both because he had known distresses, and because he was an Englishman by birth, and not a Norman. To strengthen this last hold upon them, the king wished to marry an English lady, and could think of no other wife than Maud the Good, the daughter of the King of Scotland. Although this good princess did not love the king, she was so affected by the representations the nobles made to her of the great charity it would be in her to unite the Norman and Saxon races, and prevent hatred and bloodshed between them for the future, that she consented to be his wife. After some disputing among the priests, who said that as she had been in a convent in her youth, and had worn the veil of a nun, she could not lawfully be married, against which the princess stated that her aunt, with whom she had lived in her youth, had indeed sometimes thrown a piece of black stuff over her, but for no other reason than because the nun's veil was the only dress the conquering Normans respected in girl or woman, and not because she had taken the vows of a nun, which she never had. She was declared free to marry, and was made King Henry's queen. A good queen she was, beautiful, kind-hearted, and worthy of a better husband than the king. For he was a cunning and unscrupulous man, though firm and clever, he cared very little for his word, and took any means to gain his ends. All this is shown in his treatment of his brother Robert. Robert, who had suffered him to be refreshed with water, and who had sent him the wine from his own table, when he was shut up with the crows flying below him, parched with thirst, in the castle on the top of St. Michael's Mount, where his red brother would have let him die. Before the king began to deal with Robert, he removed and disgraced all the favorites of the late king who were for the most part base characters much detested by the people. Flambard, or Firebrand, whom the late king had made Bishop of Durham of all things in the world, Henry imprisoned in the tower. But Firebrand was a great joker and a jolly companion, and made himself so popular with the guards that they pretended to know nothing about a long rope that was sent into his prison at the bottom of a deep flagon of wine. The guards took the wine, and Firebrand took the rope, with which, when they were fast asleep, he let himself down from a window in the night, and so got cleverly aboard ship and away to Normandy. Now Robert, when his brother Fine Scholar came to the throne, was still absent in the Holy Land. Henry pretended that Robert had been made sovereign of that country, and he had been away so long that the ignorant people believed it. But behold, when Henry had been some time King of England, Robert came home to Normandy, having leisurely returned from Jerusalem through Italy in which beautiful country he had enjoyed himself very much, and had married a lady as beautiful as itself. In Normandy he found Firebrand waiting to urge him to assert his claim to the English crown, and declare war against King Henry. This, after great loss of time in feasting and dancing with his beautiful Italian wife among his Norman friends, he at last did. The English in general were on King Henry's side, though many of the Normans were on Robert's. But the English sailors deserted the king, and took a great part of the English fleet over to Normandy, so that Robert came to invade this country in no foreign vessels, but in English ships. The virtuous Anselm, however, whom Henry had invited back from abroad, and made Archbishop of Canterbury, was steadfast in the king's cause, and it was so well supported that the two armies, instead of fighting, made a peace. Poor Robert, who trusted anybody and everybody, readily trusted his brother the king and agreed to go home and receive a pension from England, on condition that all his followers were fully pardoned. This the king very faithfully promised, but Robert was no sooner gone than he began to punish them. Among them was the Earl of Shrewsbury, who, on being summoned by the king to answer to five-and-forty accusations, rode away to one of his strong castles, shut himself up therein, called around him his tenants and vassals, and fought for his liberty, but was defeated and banished. 
Robert, with all his faults, was so true to his word that when he first heard of this nobleman having risen against his brother, he laid waste the Earl of Shrewsbury's estates in Normandy, to show the king that he would favour no breach of their treaty. Finding on better information afterwards that the Earl's only crime was having been his friend, he came over to England in his old thoughtless warm-hearted way to intercede with the king, and remind him of the solemn promise to pardon all his followers. This confidence might have put the false king to the blush, but it did not. Pretending to be very friendly, he so surrounded his brother with spies and traps, that Robert, who was quite in his power, had nothing for it but to renounce his pension and escape while he could. Getting home to Normandy, and understanding the king better now, he naturally allied himself with his old friend the Earl of Shrewsbury, who still had thirty castles in that country. This was exactly what Henry wanted. He immediately declared that Robert had broken the treaty, and next year invaded Normandy. He pretended that he came to deliver the Normans, at their own request, from his brother's misrule. There is reason to fear that his misrule was bad enough, for his beautiful wife had died, leaving him with an infant son, and his court was again so careless, dissipated, and ill-regulated, that it was said he sometimes lay in bed for a day for want of clothes to put on, his attendants having stolen all his dresses. But he headed his army like a brave prince and a gallant soldier, though he had the misfortune to be taken prisoner by King Henry with four hundred of his knights. Among them was poor harmless Edgar Atheling, whom Robert loved well. Edgar was not important enough to be severe with. The king afterwards gave him a small pension, which he lived upon and died upon in peace, among the quiet woods and fields of England. And Robert, poor, kind, generous, wasteful, heedless Robert, with so many faults, and yet with virtues that might have made a better and a happier man, what was the end of him? If the king had had the magnanimity to say with a kind air, Brother, tell me, before these noblemen, that from this time you will be my faithful follower and friend, and never raise your hand against me or my forces more, he might have trusted Robert to the death. But the king was not a magnanimous man. He sentenced his brother to be confined for life in one of the royal castles. In the beginning of his imprisonment, he was allowed to ride out, guarded. But he one day broke away from his guard and galloped off. He had the evil fortune to ride into a swamp, where his horse stuck fast and he was taken. When the king heard of it, he ordered him to be blinded, which was done by putting a red-hot metal basin on his eyes. And so, in darkness and in prison, many years, he thought of all his past life, of the time he had wasted, of the treasure he had squandered, of the opportunities he had lost, of the youth he had thrown away, of the talents he had neglected. Sometimes, on fine autumn mornings, he would sit and think of the old hunting parties in the free forest, where he had been the foremost and the gayest. Sometimes, in the still nights, he would wake, and mourn for the many nights that had stolen past him at the gaming table. Sometimes would seem to hear upon the melancholy wind the old songs of the minstrels. Sometimes would dream, in his blindness, of the light and glitter of the Norman court. Many and many a time he groped back in his fancy to Jerusalem, where he had fought so well, or at the head of his brave companions bowed his feathered helmet to the shouts of welcome greeting him in Italy, and seemed again to walk among the sunny vineyards, or on the shore of the blue sea with his lovely wife. And then, thinking of her grave, and of his fatherless boy, he would stretch out his solitary arms and weep. At length one day there lay in prison, dead, with cruel and disfiguring scars upon his eyelids, bandaged from his jailer's sight, but on which the eternal heavens looked down, a worn old man of eighty. He had once been Robert of Normandy. Pity him. At the time when Robert of Normandy was taken prisoner by his brother, Robert's little son was only five years old. This child was taken, too, and carried before the king, sobbing and crying, for young as he was, he knew he had good reason to be afraid of his royal uncle. The king was not much accustomed to pity those who were in his power, but his cold heart seemed for the moment to soften towards the boy. He was observed to make a great effort as if to prevent himself from being cruel, and ordered the child to be taken away, whereupon a certain baron, who had married a daughter of Duke Robert's, by name Heli of saint saint took charge of him tenderly. The king's gentleness did not last long. Before two years were over, he sent messengers to this lord's castle to seize the child and bring him away. The baron was not there at the time, but his servants were faithful, 
and carried the boy off in his sleep and hid him. When the baron came home, and was told what the king had done, he took the child abroad, and leading him by the hand went from king to king and from court to court, relating how the child had a claim to the throne of England, and how his uncle the king, knowing that he had that claim, would have murdered him, perhaps, but for his escape. The youth and innocence of the pretty little William Fitzrobert, for that was his name, made him many friends at that time. When he became a young man, the King of France, uniting with the French Counts of Anjou and Flanders, supported his cause against the King of England, and took many of the King's towns and castles in Normandy. But King Henry, artful and cunning always, bribed some of William's friends with money, some with promises, some with power. He bought off the Count of Anjou by promising to marry his eldest son, also named William, to the Count's daughter. And indeed the whole trust of this king's life was such in bargains, and he believed, as many another king has done since, and as one king did in France a very little time ago, that every man's truth and honour can be bought at some price. For all this he was so afraid of William Fitzrobert and his friends that for a long time he believed his life to be in danger, and never lay down to sleep, even in his palace surrounded by his guards, without having a sword and buckler at his bedside. To strengthen his power, the king with great ceremony betrothed his eldest daughter Matilda, then a child only eight years old, to be the wife of Henry V, the Emperor of Germany. To raise her marriage portion, he taxed the English people in a most oppressive manner, then treated them to a great procession, to restore their good humour, and sent Matilda away in fine state, with the German ambassadors, to be educated in the country of her future husband. And now his queen, Maud the Good, unhappily died. It was a sad thought for that gentle lady, that the only hope with which she had married a man whom she had never loved, the hope of reconciling the Norman and English races, had failed. At the very time of her death, Normandy and all France was in arms against England, for so soon as his last danger was over, King Henry had been false to all the French powers he had promised, bribed, and bought, and they had naturally united against him. After some fighting, however, in which few suffered but the unhappy common people, who always suffered whatsoever was the matter, he began to promise, bribe, and buy again, and by those means, and by the help of the Pope, who exerted himself to save more bloodshed, and by solemnly declaring over and over again that he really was in earnest this time, and would keep his word, the king made peace. One of the first consequences of this peace was that the king went over to Normandy with his son Prince William and a great retinue, to have the prince acknowledged as his successor by the Norman nobles, and to contract the promised marriage, this was one of the many promises the king had broken, between him and the daughter of the Count of Anjou. Both these things were triumphantly done, with great show and rejoicing, and on the 25th of November, in the year 1120, the whole retinue prepared to embark at the port of Barfleur for the voyage home. On that day, and at that place, there came to the king Fitzstephen, a sea captain, and said, My liege, my father served your father all his life upon the sea. He steered the ship with the golden boy upon the prow in which your father sailed to conquer England. I beseech you to grant me the same office. I have a fair vessel in the harbour here, called the White Ship, manned by fifty sailors of renown. I pray you, sire, to let your servant have the honour of steering you in the White Ship to England. I am sorry, friend, replied the king, that my vessel is already chosen, and that I cannot, therefore, sail with the son of the man who served my father. But the prince and all his company shall go along with you in the fair White Ship, manned by the fifty sailors of renown. An hour or two afterwards the king set sail in the vessel he had chosen, accompanied by other vessels, and sailing all night with a fair and gentle wind, arrived upon the coast of England in the morning. While it was yet night, the people in some of those ships heard a faint wild cry come over the sea, and wondered what it was. Now the prince was a dissolute, debauched young man of eighteen, who bore no love to the English, and had declared that when he came to the throne he would yoke them to the plough like oxen. He went aboard the white ship, and with one hundred and forty youthful nobles like himself, among whom were eighteen noble ladies of the highest rank. All this gay company with their servants and the fifty sailors made three hundred souls aboard the fair white ship. "'Give three casks of wine, Fitzstephen,' said the prince, "'to the fifty sailors of renown. My father the king has sailed out of the harbour. 
What time is there to make merry here, and yet reach England with the rest? Prince, said Fitz Stephen, before morning my fifty and the white ship shall overtake the swiftest vessel in attendance on your father the king, if we sail at midnight. Then the prince commanded to make merry, and the sailors drank out the three casks of wine, and the prince and all the noble company danced in the moonlight on the deck of the white ship. When at last she shot out of the harbour of Barfleur, there was not a sober seaman on board, but the sails were all set and the oars all going merrily. Fitz Stephen had the helm. The gay young nobles and the beautiful ladies, wrapped in mantles of various bright colours to protect them from the cold, talked, laughed, and sang. The prince encouraged the fifty sailors to row harder yet for the honour of the white ship. Crash! A terrific cry broke from three hundred hearts. It was the cry the people in the distant vessels of the king heard faintly on the water. The white ship had struck a rock, was filling, going down. Fitzstephen hurried the prince into a boat with some few nobles. Push off, he whispered, and row to land. It is not far, and the sea is smooth. The rest of us must die. But as they rowed away fast from the sinking ship, the prince heard the voice of his sister Marie, the Countess of Perche, calling for help. He never in his life had been so good as he was then. He cried in an agony, Row back at any risk, I cannot bear to leave her. They rowed back. As the prince held out his arms to catch his sister, such numbers leaped in that the boat was overset, and in the same instant the white ship went down. Only two men floated. They both clung to the main yard of the ship, which had broken from the mast, and now supported them. One asked the other who he was. He said, I am a nobleman, Godfrey by name, the son of Gilbert de Ligel. And you, said he, I am Birold, a poor butcher of Rouen, was the answer. Then they said together, Lord be merciful to us both, and tried to encourage one another, as they drifted in the cold benumbing sea on that unfortunate November night. By and by another man came swimming towards them, whom they knew, when he pushed aside his long wet hair, to be Fitz Stephen. "'Where is the prince?' said he. "'Gone, gone,' the two cried together. "'Neither he, nor his brother, nor his sister, nor the king's niece, nor her brother, nor any of all the brave three hundred, noble or commoner, except we three, has risen above the water.' Fitz Stephen, with a ghastly face, cried, "'Woe, woe to me!' and sunk to the bottom." The other two clung to the yard for some hours. At length the young noble said faintly, I am exhausted and chilled with the cold, and can hold no longer. Farewell, good friend, God preserve you. So he dropped and sunk, and of all the brilliant crowd the poor butcher of Rouen alone was saved. In the morning some fishermen saw him floating in his sheepskin coat and got him into their boat, the sole relator of the dismal tale. For three days no one dared to carry the intelligence to the king. At length they sent into his presence a little boy, who, weeping bitterly and kneeling at his feet, told him that the white ship was lost with all on board. The king fell to the ground like a dead man, and never, never afterwards was seen to smile. But he plotted again, and he promised again, and bribed and bought again in his old deceitful way. Having no son to succeed him after all his pains— the prince will never yoke us to the plough now, said the English people. He took a second wife, Adelaide, or Alice, a duke's daughter, and the pope's niece. Having no more children, however, he proposed to the barons to swear that they would recognize as his successor his daughter Matilda, whom, as she was now a widow, he had married to the eldest son of the Count of Anjou, Geoffrey, surnamed Plantagenet, from a custom he had of wearing a sprig of flowering broom, called Jeannette, in French, in his cap for a feather. As one false man usually makes many, and as a false king in particular is pretty certain to make a false court, the barons took the oath about the succession of Matilda and her children after her, twice over, without in the least intending to keep it. The king was now relieved from any remaining fears of William Fitzrobert by his death in the monastery of St. Ober, in France, at twenty-six years old, of a pike wound in the hand, and as Matilda gave birth to three sons, he thought the succession to the throne secure. He spent most of the latter part of his life, which was troubled by family quarrels, in Normandy, to be near Matilda. When he had reigned upward of thirty-five years and was sixty-seven years old, he died of an indigestion and fever, 
brought on by eating, when he was far from well, of a fish called lamprey, against which he had often been cautioned by his physicians. His remains were brought over to Reading Abbey to be buried. You may perhaps hear the cunning and promised breaking of King Henry I called policy by some people, and diplomacy by others. Neither of these fine words will in the least mean that it was true, and nothing that is not true can possibly be good. His greatest merit that I know of was his love of learning. I should have given him greater credit even for that, if it had been strong enough to induce him to spare the eyes of a certain poet he once took prisoner, who was a knight besides. But he ordered the poet's eyes to be torn from his head, because he had laughed at him in his verses. And the poet, in the pain of that torture, dashed out his own brains against his prison wall. King Henry I was avaricious, revengeful, and so false, that I suppose a man never lived whose word was less to be relied upon. End of chapter 10